does a lot of theoretical population biology as well as evolutionary ecology. He has done a lot of dynamic models, really trying to understand the mechanisms that drive ecological and evolutionary dynamics. He's also the author of the book Dynamic Models in Biology with John Guggenheimer, which is a classic for that field. Um, he is a fellow of the Ecological Society of America, has received the American Society of Naturalists Presidential Award, and also given the Tensley Lecture at the British Ecological Society. Um, and what I really like about um, Steve Elner's website, and I'm assuming it's up to date, <laughs> is that he, he has lab, lab mottos, and, and the first one, which is paraphrasing Benjamin Franklin, is that nothing is certain but predators and parasites. <laughs> and then, then he goes on to say, there may be another, if, if we had another one, it would probably be something like evolution changes everything. And I think that is a great introduction <laughs> to this particular debate. But we're going to have Katja start this debate. You know, I guess Les has been introduced multiple times. Um, so we know him. We know him. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, uh, I love ecological theory, I love evolutionary theory, there's some really great theory that combines both of them, but um, can you do ecological theory without evolution? Absolutely you can. Um, you definitely don't need evolution um, uh, in all ecological theories. Um, and so, um, to argue for that, um, I mean theory, as all of you know, um, theory kind of involves abstraction, it involves simplification. Um, uh, it's, you know, you, you, there's a lot of people who do modeling right now where you put it in the kitchen sink, you know, but I think in terms of really nice, clear, concise theory, there's, you have to abstract away and you have to kind of get rid of the parts that don't matter for the specific question you're addressing. Um, and so, um, evolution in the context of some questions, not others, but evolution in the context of some question, qu uh, questions is kind of um, a bell and whistle, you know, is, is kind of noise, is, um, is variation um, that, you know, I mean there's variation in populations, but there's variations which are genetic um, and heritable, and, and variation which is also not genetic, and do you always have to include variation in a population necessarily for ecological theory? No, I mean, I, I think, I think, um, I think you have theory um, aimed at certain kind of patterns that you observe, um, uh, and, and in some cases that theory has to kind of involve both ecology and evolution, um, but for some questions and for understanding certain um, uh, patterns, um, you don't need evolution. Sometimes it's just a, all you need is kind of um, uh, a good idea of kind of underlying ecological processes um, that result in these emergent sort of um, patterns you're interested in explaining with the theory. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, I, I just want to throw in an alternative perspective on that. <laughs> um, I, I just want to see if you, you might recognize the quotes, um, the papers that some of these quotes come from. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was told that the, the word brutal got thrown around. <laughs> I thought, well, okay, let's see what I can do. Um, it's not natural for me, but. Force for some. Let's see. Um, um, major advances in understanding and predicting disease dynamics have been made for childhood diseases such as measles where immunity is permanent and um, tr strain transcendent. However, among the most ubiquitous diseases are influenza, malaria, and diarrheal diseases, many of which have underlying strain structure with only partial cross immunity between strains. That sounds so familiar. <laughs> with advances in molecular epidemiology and phylogenetic approaches, the dynamics of these multi-strain diseases are starting to be examined with implications for early warning systems and vaccine development. Sure. Yeah. Um, to, so, understand, to understand um, the, the dynamics of rapidly evolving RNA viruses, you have to incorporate evolution, I agree. Yes. But that's not all ecological theory. Um, <laughs> it's, not all of, it's not all of ecological theory, right. Um, but it is um, certainly, as you noted, you noted, <laughs> the ubiquitous diseases that have this, and um, it's important uh, to remember it. Um, 
Steve, I remember a beautiful paper you wrote a few years ago, though, which was asking the question <laughs> about rapid evolution and was meant by rapid evolution, and that's when evolution actually affects the growth rate of populations. And then you had some key, um, key examples there. In some cases, yes, evolution was necessary to try to, to understand the dynamics, the population dynamics, um, but not in all cases. Not in all cases, right. Um, so why is that? <laughs> okay. So, right. um, so he was he was forced to be the devil's advocate. I was he forced to be a devil's advocate. He obviously had the harder um, right. yeah. thing to argue. But. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I am going to argue um, for something um, um, rather than just folding to someone who is saying exactly what I would have said. If I would <laughs> able to go first. Um, but, um, um, but, but that is, um, I'm going to go to quote from a paper of, of Katya's, and it's about episodic immune escape. Um, and it, the argument there is that we have to understand immune escape from many diseases in order to um, understand their dynamics, and that this is something that happens in a punctuated manner, that it happens not constantly, and not as a ubiquitous feature of what's going on all the time, but sometimes it happens, and it happens really fast, and then it changes everything. And I would argue that the um, ability to do ecological theory without doing um, evol thinking about evolution is like the ability to ride a motorcycle without a helmet. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a trivial sense in which you can do it, right? An obvious sense in which you can do it. But it works until it doesn't. And the same thing, you know, right? And then you better have your organ donor card. Okay. All right? And if you can, you know, um, every parent has had your, your child ask, Mom, Dad, can I please? And well, there's, an answer, there's a sense in which the answer is yes, your child can go ahead and do that, but it's something that's gonna work until it doesn't and you wanna stop them, right? And um, the same thing I think is true about do, um, asking any ecological question without thinking about the potential role of evolution, which is that it's gonna work until it doesn't. Um, and part of that is because the rapid evolution, okay, we've sort of, um, I haven't played a role in this. We've gone astray in thinking about rapid evolution in terms of like comparing the average pace of evolution, area change, and ecological change. And what's really important is the maximum rate of evolutionary change, the way that it can kick in like that. Um, and part of that is because um, of um, natural enemies, specialized natural enemies, so the metapopulation dynamics of your predators and your pathogens. Right, like the guppy story, mm -hmm. right? A population winking in and out of existence mm -hmm. suddenly makes a big difference. And suddenly evolution that hasn't mattered for a long time, suddenly it kicks in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the other one is that when you couple ecological and evolutionary dynamics, you often get a slow, fast system. Okay, something with a separation of time scale. And the characteristic of those is that some of the variables do almost nothing for a very long time, okay? And then boom, they cut in. So um, my, my argument would be to, um, I guess in honor of Les, or in the spirit of Les, I will, um, I will quote that eminent Southern philosopher, Lester Flatt, um, and say that we, uh, we always have to sleep with one eye open. That is, um, that, that, right? We always have to be, we can't, we shouldn't dare to do ecology without worrying that evolutionary processes might kick in and radically undermine um, the conclusions that we're drawing. Actually, it was the Dalai Lama who said about marriage, he said, before you get married, you should sleep with both eyes open. And he said, after you get married, one eye. Thanks for inviting I find myself in an awkward position. First off, was that a brutal debate? <laughs> 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 yeah. But they have staked out very different positions. Katya says you can do it without evolution groups. Uh, as, as Steve says you, 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 you have to have evolution. And, and uh, so I find myself in the position of, a, of an old Zen master who uh, he had uh, this, uh, he, he had a, 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 a guy, a student who, who, who said, I, I know some uh, married couple who's having a very difficult time. And uh, 
we talked to them. So the Zen master said, okay, I'll go. He sat and the, the, the three of them came in and the, and the Zen master said to the woman, tell me what's the problem. And she just ripped into this guy, just ripped into him. And, and he said, you're right, you're right. And, and then he turned to the husband and said, well, what was from me? And he just ripped into her and he said, you're right, you're right, you're right. And the, the guy that brought the couple turned to the Zen master and said, look, they both can't be right. And he said, you're right. <laughs> Forgetting about, we're, we're narrowly defining ecology, uh, and uh, there was a, there's a whole school of ecology. You can do a lot of ecology without evolution. The question is, is it, is it any good ecology? And that's a separate question. There are plenty of ecologists that do ecology without evolution. I think that they're mistaken, but yet there's a whole school right down the street. We have uh, representatives of that uh, school. Like uh, Sonia, she doesn't believe in that anymore either. <laughs> the, the Odom School, for instance, and uh, the school named after Gino, he hated evolution. Hated evolution. Didn't think that evolution was important at all. And all the ecology that he did uh, didn't have any evolution in it at all. But I knew Gene Odom. He was a friend of mine. And uh, <laughs> and when I came to when I came to Emory. You know, <laughs> I'm sure you know Gene Odom. <laughs> Gene Odom. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, I came to UGA. I don't think Sony was there. No, it was way before. And uh, so I came, came there, and uh, I've known Gene for a really long time, and he, and, and he had this deep southern accent, you know, kind of high, spooky voice, a little squeaky. And, and uh, he says, well, Les, you know, uh, I'm really glad that Emory's finally got an ecologist, you know, because uh, uh, my daddy was the dean of Emory College. <laughs> and uh, they never really liked ecology. <laughs> they there in Emory, and everything's about uh, medical school, you know. He said, I'm glad they finally got an ecologist there. And I said, well, Gene, I hate to tell you this, but I work on the ecology of infectious diseases, and I work almost exclusively with people in the medical school. And he looked at me and he said, well, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> To acknowledge, we have to, we have to acknowledge the existence of this other school, which does not believe even in the operation. They, their, their approach is different. And when Jim Brown, this is just kind of a historical side, because that's where I am right now. <laughs> when Jim Brown gave his MacArthur lecture uh, at the Ecological Society, at the beginning of his lecture, he pointed out that there were these two major schools in ecology, which was the Odom School, and the kind of Michigan School, the biologically based, community, species based approach to ecology. And that those two schools had never been fused. And he thought that he was trying to, was going to be able to fuse them in some way. One was focused on energy, and the other was focused on species. Gene never kind of believed in species. And all the ecology that you're talking about is kind of like species. So I just want to point out that there's a whole other way of doing ecology with lots of people do that doesn't even believe in species. The question is, can we put those, can we, can we put those two together? Can we put those two together? Jim Brown thought he was going to be able to do that. And where you put that together is in, the, in things like the metabolic theory, where uh, speciation rates and mutation rates are being driven by environmental energy concerns, mm -hmm. like productivity patterns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there may be some fusion, in which case you can't ever do ecology without doing evolution. Mm -hmm. um, but there's the synthesis of those two, mm -hmm. the, the, the non-species-based approach to ecology and the species-based mm -hmm. approach to ecology, that has not, has not come to any kind of fruition. Mm -hmm. Any responses from the room? Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. So I told my colleagues, uh, Rosemary and Peter Grant, that uh, I was going to be in this debate. 
and they, they asked me to pass on the bit like after we'd written a piece in a paper about the Darwin's Finches that they'd written, which said something like, um, nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of ecology. So, <laughs> that was actually one other thing I was going to mention is maybe we should turn the question around and say, you know, can you do evolutionary theory without actually thinking about ecology? I mean, ecology and evolution is N or NE, right? I mean, that's an, and, and sigma or s selection coefficient, right? Um, but how much more ecology do you actually have to integrate? I think it's integrate? a <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's an example. Okay, so, so, so for instance, Many of us uh, know, uh, um, oh, uh, who, who would spell over again? Now I'm having trouble with names. David Quammen. Oh, so, so David Quammen. And um, uh, so his book that he's working on now is, uh, he thinks that Darwin was absolutely, and the visual model of Darwin was absolutely wrong. Uh, because we think of it as a branch in a tree. And there are, and whereas his whole point is the discovery of lateral gene transfer changes our entire mental image of what evolution lo even looks like. Is there any ecology involved in that? Understanding of a fundamental transformation of our evolutionary model. Well, at, so uh, there. I, now I'm ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get brutal. <laughs> I don't think we know how to operate without thinking about <coughs> species in, in ecologists, right? Other than abstracting it away into higher level things. But, but the notion that, you know, at the bottom it might all be a mush, right? That, that you don't have those, those clear boundaries is going to make a lot of trouble for the way we conceptualize, conceptualize things. Um, that may be part of why ecologists avoid, like, microbes, right? That they, well, they, just the older different. school just dumped them into a big box, which is called <laughs> decomposers. Right, or you're right, or you'll see a food web where it'll say bacteria. Yeah. Right, um, and and we, then you got the fish now, the species. Yeah. Remember First, that in the origin yeah. of species, Darwin never defined what a species was. He never talked about the species concept. He just right. took it as a group. First, yeah. yeah. I just want to, you know, with bacteria, you know, the, the thing I, one of the reasons I switched to bacteria is it, ecology and, and, the, and, and, and genetics are the same. There's no way of, uh, you know, the, it, it, in fact, the evolution is a pain in the ass. I mean, you want to repeat an experiment, you got to go back to the freezer because the strains have been fall. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so, and the other thing is, say for horizontal transfer, which we of course, is another equation, but uh, I mean, if clonal selection is, is what's happening, and it's a, you know, in Lenski's experiments, you sort of, is that an ecological study? Is that an evolutionary study? Is it a genetic study? I mean, it is really a, a study of both the ecological and genetics all occurring in one, one system, so you're not separating them. In, in, in uh, higher organisms, you can get away with it if you know, you're working with lions and, and cheetahs. You, know, you don't have to worry about it too much. But in, in microbes and infectious disease, you've got to worry about it all the time. Not worry, you've got to account for it all the time. What about measles? What? What about measles? Measles, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. You can, right? drive, you can drive the measles cycle without a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Probably why so many of us do it. Right? <laughs> as, as far as we know, you know, as far as we know. <laughs> well, well, what about that not only species, but also individuals within species might be, are, in our cases, certainly are, colonies of other species and organisms. So we're, what we're studying is communities, and I don't see how you can study communities without both ecology and evolution. But I think this is again getting at kind of um, uh, what you, when you're developing theory, right, what do you bury under the rug or throw away? What do you ignore versus what do you focus on, right? And, and I mean, if you want to, I mean, yes, you can kind of focus on the microbiome and the individual cells that actually make up the individual, but calling it an individual for some theories is, is totally fine, right? Um, so, it's so it's, again, it's an abstraction. And I think it, it really, you know, whether you have to include evolution or not really does depend really on, on ultimately the, the, the patterns and the questions you're trying to address with theory, right? Um, 
Uh, what was the other thing I wanted to kind of... Um, Oh, with a one eye open sort of, um, you know, comment. Um, I mean, yeah, you have to kind of, you know, sleep with one eye open because evolution might happen. It might happen episodically and so forth. But, but other other things could also happen which aren't evolution, which might kind of um, surprise you, right? You know, there could be heterogeneity. You know, that that is, you know, in terms of bacteria, you know, it could be heterogeneity in where things are in the cell cycle, right? I mean, that's not genetic heterogeneity, you know? Um, so you might actually have to, you know, whether you keep your eye open or not, you know, it's, it's, if you keep it open, it could be for many, many different things and evolution is only one of them. That's an excellent something I was hoping to bring up. And that is that I think genetic her heterogeneity is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. That um, the, the real challenge is to cope with how much heterogeneity there is um, within populations. I mean, mm -hmm. again, microbiome. All right, yes, we're colonies, but every one of us is a different colony, yeah, right? Yeah. And, that, and yeah. it's not just the fact that we're a different colony, it's that that colony oh, is wow. changing over time, exactly. right? And, you know, um, we, we talked about the importance of um, pollinators with different <coughs> preferences, right? But it doesn't, it isn't just a matter if they have different preferences, you have to worry how fast are they changing, right? The difference between permanent and dynamic heterogeneity is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. I think there's just, you know, there's all this heterogeneity that we don't know how to deal with, and that heterogeneity might be stuff that, where we really need to keep the yeah. eye open because there's always some kind, it's not always genetic, yeah. right? But there's, you know, there's heter we're dealing with populations of heterogeneous organisms, and we rarely take that into account in doing theory. Yeah. Can I ask another question? So does that mean that we should be um, choosing different model, different modeling systems uh, depending on whether we want to focus on generality, reality, or precision. Like, or do we want to like balance out those different pieces of what we're trying yeah. to do with the predictive model? Yeah. Well, do we yeah, okay. different, do we I, choose I, I, different things? Okay, let me focus it in on on a phrase that you use, which is predictive model, right? And not all the time that we're modeling, it's predictive. Right, right, that, I mean, and I think the, the point that Katya's making, which I agree with fully, is that very often when we're doing modeling, work, it's like we're doing a single factor experiment. Mm -hmm. We're varying one thing to see what, what that effect is and try to understand what this one thing does, right? And if, right, so, yeah, but, so for, but for, you know, to try to get at something, right, general, you might want to abstract things down to, let me just look at how this process and this process interact. Then when you want to be predictive, you have to worry about all, all of the things that might be going on. So I think that the, the, the critical thing is, as, as, as you both mentioned, is the recognition that this, the resolution of this question critically depends upon time scales. And that in some systems, the time scales are going to be concordant. In other questions and in other systems, the time scales may be incredibly dissimilar. So the issue of how life is organized under a horizontal gene transfer goes, goes into a time scale, which is, you can basically ignore ecological dynamics in that. You can ask ecological questions, especially those in the policy domain, you know, like, where should I put my vaccine in order to prevent a rabies epidemic from spreading? <laughs> Which is a fundamental ecological question, or how many people I should vaccinate, those kinds of things. Uh, that's going to happen at a time scale where evolution is not going to be really, really important. There are other things, like flu, where if I'm really interested in understanding and helping, you got to look at them simultaneously. So I think the critical thing is to try to understand how those two time scales interact with regard to the system and the question that you're interested in. Well, I, I will, I, I'm convinced that as time goes on, we're going to find more and more things that we think of as purely ecological processes have evolution going on on the same time scale. I think we just, we're going to keep on looking and we're going to keep on finding it. Andy. Um, I haven't talked about, uh, but I'm uh, reminded in relation of two of the issues we had today um, about a uh, comment 
attributed to uh, André Loire for geneticists, that there is a time to divide and a time to unite. <laughs> and I think we have to remember that we do it all the time. We don't just go all the way down and, and then don't go up into whatever you're doing in your field. But the other comment, and I was waiting for uh, uh, Yanis, I don't know if he's here. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we too have been involved with evolution of sexually transmitted infections in animals and humans. We did that in 2010 in the laboratories of Nobel in Sweden. We, had, we looked not at just that syphilis began that way and so forth and went this way and not, but we approached it from a variety of genetic aspects in terms of the relation of, take herpes virus, which is a virus I've been involved with. I mean, there are hundreds, almost really, 200 at least, herpes virus, which, but I focused particularly on one of them. So that's to the point. But the one I was most interested in was the genital herpes virus, which got me into sexual uh, evolution. And if anyone's interested, then I think I would give a present to Ria, who's very interested in the subject, it seems. Um, you can look it up in the New York Academy of Science of, what was it, 2011, 12? And, uh, you can look at it. <laughs> Since you brought up the Tenerio one, and there have been some uh, not too respectable uh, jokes about sex, that I thought I'd bring it in, that we need to study its evolution even more. So, do I have two minutes? So, and our final punches? Yeah. <laughs> Dave, did you want to say something? No, I, I just, I like the idea, I think it was Les who said that, you know, you've got to compare the two time scales. But I think, you know, as ecologists, we're kind of fracturing things up and to whether we're, you know, worried about gene expression. Well, what's the time scale for changes in gene expression? Or what's the time scale turnover for microbiome, right? Mm -hmm. If you acquire your microbiome at birth and you maintain it over the course of your life, that I'd be perfectly happy excluding that from my population dynamics model. So I think there's layers of, of time scale that you probably have to worry about. And maybe there's some really interesting feedbacks that can kind of flow up and down these many, many time scales. But the idea that there's two time scales, I think, is one I disagree with. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. following on yeah. from that. And if anything that raises a red flag for me, like, or, or as a ball to the red flag, is people talking about ecological time scale and evolution. They happen at the same, each can be, ecological changes can be incredibly slow. Deserts don't change much in millions of years. And, and evolutionary time can be very, very rapid. So using evolutionary time and ecological time being rapid and slow is horrible. And don't let me catch you thinking do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I will like, I'll call you on it. And I, and I, I can attest to the fact that I have known Janus now since 2000. Six. And every time I see him, he mentions this. So, <laughs> 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 for that, I want to thank you all.